Hello, I'm Suzanne James Greenleft. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land on which we live and work and pay my respect to their elders past and present. I also acknowledge all people of diversity in its many forms and champion their right to self-determination. Today we'll be joined by Federal, sorry, New South Wales Green Senator David Shoebridge. He is a social justice warrior and government accountability expert from way back. And he's going to talk to us today about Australia in Gaza. <clears throat> he's going to talk to us about the latest multi-billion dollar defence bungle he's uncovered in Senate estimates, touch on the David McBride case and give us a brief update on his federal bill to legalise marijuana, including home growth and personal use. He's very generous with his time at Green Left and we thank you for it. David, thank you for joining us. Pleasure, Suzanne. Now, my colleague Peter Boyle at Green Left recently wrote an article. He says Australia is deeply complicit in the bombing of Gaza. He notes that Senate estimates last October heard that the government had approved 350 defence export permits to Israel in the past five years, 50 of them in 2023. Uh, he also touches on the Israelis using Pine Gap for the intelligence they're using in their operations in Gaza. He quotes you as saying, and I quote, whether it is parts for fighter planes or the direct provision of artillery shells, it is disturbing that so little is known about Australia's military support for the war in Gaza. Is he right? Are we complicit in genocide there? And if you believe so, how do we even gauge that? given the level of secrecy and lack of accountability around all things defence at home, especially concerning the Middle East? Well, I mean, I think there's no question that Australia has been complicit in, in the war crimes and the collective punishment that we've seen tragically unfolding in Gaza. And I, some of that is our diplomatic cover we give to the State of Israel for its ongoing violent um, assault in Gaza. Uh, but added to that is our extraordinarily opaque, non-transparent weapons export regime. Uh, and, and I want to be clear, we have been critical, my office has been critical of the export regime um, since I took, took on the portfolio of defence um, spokes for the Greens. And, um, and, and, and the fact that Australia is willing to sell weapons to regimes like Saudi Arabia, to both sides of the civil war in, in Sudan and South Sudan, um, to the United Arab Emirates, um, uh, to countries that we know are abusing rights, human rights in our own region, such as Indonesia, as well as to Israel, should be a warning sign for any Australian about what's going wrong with our weapons export permit system. But when you look, crunch the numbers, overwhelmingly the numbers show a predominance towards defence exports towards the state of Israel. Um, and, um, and that's probably only a subset of weapons exports because uh, Australia also on projects like the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter um, contribute, you know, essential parts to the global supply chain for that particular weapons platform that, that will often see um, parts warehoused from Australia in the United States and in Europe and are then drawn down upon by Israel from those third countries. So the numbers that we see are likely only a subset of the actual reality of weapons supply from Australia to Israel. And, you know, remarkably, when we asked, when I asked the foreign minister about that in parliament, she was furiously angry with me. She said, how dare I politicise Australia's weapons exports and how dare I politicise a war? I mean, it was like um, some sort of Orwellian doublespeak coming back from our foreign minister. Of course, war is a brutally political action. And of course, exporting weapons is a brutally political decision from from Australia but you know I don't see how the government can maintain its denial in particular about Australia's help, helping to sustain Israeli F-35 fighter planes in their bombing of Gaza because they've previously celebrated the billions of dollars Australia gets from being part of that global supply chain and we supply essential elements to that weapon platform such as the actuators you know that the mechanisms that open the bomb bay doors to release the bomb on children and civilians in Gaza. And um, the, the, the federal government, Foreign Minister Wong, the Defence Minister, should start telling Australians the truth about this. Now, what Hamas did has been widely condemned, but it doesn't give Israel the right to flout international law and the rules of engagement in their response. 
Defence Minister Richard Miles quite controversially badged it unprovoked. Um, premiers and police have shut down pro-Palestinian rallies. The ABC even has been accused of pro-Israel bias and pro-Israel is all we seem to be hearing. We all know that the history of this whole sorry history between Israel, Palestine, Gaza and the West Bank goes back a very, very long way. But what I'd like to hear from you is right now in 2023, what do you see in Canberra? What is it you're seeing on the ground there in terms of political motivations driving the pro-Israel rhetoric right now? Well, I think there's a collective refusal from both Labor and the Coalition to look at this honestly and fairly. Um, and they insist upon seeing it through a very narrow partisan lens, um, supporting just the state of Israel. I mean, our, our position is very clear. Israel does have a, a right to defend itself. But that cannot involve um, the military violence against an occupied people. That is not internationally recognised as part of a right to defend yourself, inflicting large-scale military violence on an occupied people. And Francesca Albanese, the UN Rapporteur on, um, on Palestine and human rights in Palestine, made that absolutely clear in her contributions last week. Um, yet it seems that um, nobody in government Nobody in the coalition wants to hear that. I, I think there's a, a convenient lens that they're trying to play over this, which is history both began and ended on the 7th of October. Um, and that way you can simply um, see it as a, 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 an appalling crime by Hamas, which is being responded to as an appalling crime by Hamas. Free of context, free of history, free of any having to judge the the the... The, the obvious, I think, um, clear war crimes that Israel has committed since that date. Now, of course, we join in condemning the violence against civilians inflicted by Hamas, a terrible criminal act, um, that are, and the taking of hostages. You know, we have repeatedly condemned that, and I, as I think, you know, millions and millions of Australians have done that. But where has been the equal sense of horror and condemnation for the now 5,000 children who have been killed um, by the Israeli attack on Gaza. And I don't know how you can explain that other than an unwillingness um, to, to, to budge from a very rusted on uh, one-sided view about supporting the state of Israel, whether it's right or wrong. And I don't think we could pretend that Australia's foreign policy here has been independently set. Um, it's very clearly been in large part directed by Washington um, Australia desperately wants to land this AUKUS deal, um, get access to nuclear submarines and technology from the from the US. As part of that, we have to be seen to be the most overly loyal US ally on the planet, and therefore that leaves them very little room in their worldview um, to differentiate Australia's foreign policy position from that of the United States. And we're literally being led along like a little poodle in this space. And what I find so disturbing about that is that means a refusal to look at the scale of the violence against people in Palestine, the, the thousands of Palestinian kids being killed, and, and to say what I would have thought millions of Australians want our government to say, which is not a humanitarian pause to allow this killing to start again, but a permanent peace, a permanent ceasefire leading to a just peace and an end of the occupation. And how that, why they can't say that, it's hard to see it and any other lens other than through that geopolitical lens of wanting Australia to be the most inseparable, unquestioning ally of the United States in this conflict. I'd like to acknowledge the true human cost of this to the people that live in that whole region. They've suffered terrible civilian and especially child casualty. Their grief in burying their children in what has to be blood soaked dirt by now doesn't know boundaries or state borders or affiliations with allies and doesn't much care about orca submarines and i wonder what is australia doing in terms of real aid on the ground to help the victims of what's yet another holy war we've been dragged into in the middle east yeah, well suzanne i mean you would hope political leaders don't care about what nationality a child is they don't care which side of a border they live in they don't care what their religion is they don't care what that child's ethnicity is that the death of a child should be a thing that um touches a wellspring of humanity in all of us um regardless as i said whether the child's an israeli child or a palestinian child 
Um, but there does seem to be this ability that some politicians have to say, well, actually, that child is more worthy of our attention. That child is a tragedy. That child is a crime. And the other one is collateral damage in somehow or other. And I, I, I can't do that in my head. And I can't understand how, um, how you know, particularly Labor ministers and the Prime Minister seem to be engaging in that kind of analysis in their own heads. It's, it's, it's hard to conceive. Um, so uh, I think you you know, to, to, to so step away from a common humanity in your response requires a kind of, uh, some kind of aggressive intervention from your own view about geopolitics and maybe narrow political self-interest to so step away from that, you know, I think instinctive common humanity that we would all feel in those circumstances. And, and I do think it is the, um, the push for this AUKUS deal, the push for the United States Alliance and Labor not wanting to be wedged on um, national security by the coalition. Uh, and, and that eventually means that you can't distinguish Labor's position from that of the coalition, other than in some tiny extreme elements, that their core position is indistinguishable. Speaking of outrageously expensive defence contracts, I'd like to ask you now about weapons manufacturing and what you've recently uncovered in Senate estimate hearings about a bungled $45 billion boat deal naval boat, I believe, that resulted in you referring the matter to the national, the new National Anti-Corruption Commission. Can you tell us what triggered that referral? What went wrong with this particular procurement? What were your concerns with it? And what do you hope to achieve with the referral to the NACC? Well, Suzanne, you couldn't make this stuff up. So a $45 billion procurement, to be clear, apart from the AUKUS nuclear submarines, that's far and away the biggest single procurement in defence space. And it's the single biggest Commonwealth procurement project by like a factor. You know, it's to give you a sense of scale, the Snowy Mountains pro, um, hydro thing, which is said to be this huge mega project that's blown out of proportion. That entire thing is $12 billion. And this Hunter um, frigate, uh, Hunter class of frigate acquisition is a $45 billion project. Like you could build four massively inflated snowy hydro schemes with it. Um, um, so, that's the scale of the project. And, and my interest was triggered initially by, um, oh, I'd had concerns raised with my office that it, was, it had gone off the rails, but then uh, Australian National Audit Office did a review of it. And they said, astoundingly, that the whole thing went out to tender and that defence never assessed the competing tenders for value for money. Like they didn't look at value for money. And they ignored a whole lot of risks about the, the likelihood of the project actually ever being delivered. And they never told the government that they didn't assess it for value for money. And this one, the now successful proponent, just at three different occasions got pulled out of the, the, the rubbish bin because it had been rejected. It would be rejected on any initial point. So it was pulled out of the bin, first of all, to be shortlisted, then um, for consideration. Um, um, in the very initial phrase, then it was pulled out of the bin again to be put on a three, three proponent final shortlist for the tender, and it wouldn't have got there by on its own merits. And then having been taken through that assessment process, was then pulled out and put forward to government as the preferred um, uh, uh, platform, and recommended be adopted by the by the government, and then was then adopted by the government. And um, two of those key decisions, the last two, were done by committees chaired by the former Defence Secretary, a man called Richardson, uh, Dennis Richardson. And, and now the, the final decision to bump it up to the Minister for Approval was from a committee chaired by the current Defence Secretary, Greg Moriarty. And um, the ANAO report said, well, look, you know, we actually can't find the documents for either of these committee recommendations. We can't work out why these committees, two critical points chaired by the Defence Secretary, recommended this British platform. Sorry, um, and they don't have a record of that. Well, ANA asked Defence to give all their records, and Defence had three quarters of a million records that they produced for this project, right? They had three quarters of a million records. It just so happens that the two critical records of the two critical decisions inside defense are mysteriously missing. They just can't find them. These out of three quarters of a million documents, just these two um, have mysteriously gone missing and um, inexplicably so. 
And um, I find, found that extraordinary. And when we investigated that in budget estimates, there was no credible explanation given by the current Defence Secretary. Um, when we pointed out that how could you possibly do a tender for a $45 billion project and not test value for money? I mean, what is wrong with defence? I mean, when you look at the Commonwealth procurement rules, that is the first and most critical thing that a tender does. Absolutely. Test for value for money. Um, they couldn't explain how they hadn't done a test for value for money. They couldn't explain how they didn't tell the government that they hadn't done a, a test on evaluation for money. And when every avenue we went down for and asked for an explanation, we got a can't help you, Gov, don't know, have no records, couldn't help you. I mean, obviously that's what motivated us referring this to the National Anti-Corruption Commission. Um, because, you know, I'm the, I don't have any evidence that someone's taken a brown paper bag of money and gone off and done this or gone off and done that. But what I can tell you is the whole the whole procurement process from a public public policy point of view was utterly corrupted from a public policy point of view. And in, Indeed, just in the last week, we've seen a, a kind of formal mea culpa being issued by uh, the Defence Secretary Moriarty, where he says, oh, we've had a look at this project and we didn't assess for value for money, we didn't assess for risk, we didn't assess for timeliness, <laughs> we didn't assess for this, and oh, there's some lessons to be learned. And and, and what did they assess for? <laughs> you know, what on, they spent like the $150 million or so doing this assessment. Um, process on public money and and yeah and 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 now we're seeing the whole thing has blown out this will surprise you Suzanne not having tested for value for money the the budget has blown out again the delivery timetables have blown out it's going to provide you know from a purely defense perspective it's going to provide a platform that is next to useless um in in their current sort of defense needs it'll do a bit of submarine warfare but we'll have will not really be survivable in a modern um in a modern any kind of modern conflict. Um, and it looks like they're going to keep the budget of $45 billion, but instead of delivering nine ships, we're probably going to get six or five. Um, did I say you couldn't make this thing up? And it's the single largest procurement project that the Commonwealth has on the books. And and sorry, and finally, and, and the Labor government wants to give these same people $368 billion to play with with nuclear submarines. No one's got the sack. No one's been held to account. No one's been demoted. Oh, it's Some homeless guy on job seeker gets accused of rotten taxpayer funds. Yeah. You're a um, accountability expert and have been for many, many years. We all know that trying to get any accountability in a secret, super bottomless pit of money, Defence, Homeland Security, super department that now passes for Australia's defence and intelligence regime, is very, very difficult at the best of times. The go-to argument always, especially since September 11, being, well, we can't tell you what's going on because it's a matter of national security. Now, you and I both know that that's only true to a particular extent. It's not, there's a lot of other things that can be done in terms of accountability and transparency. Uh, as you just outlined, the, the complete rewarding of taxpayers' money without even what used to be basic record keeping is just gobsmacking. So what is an appropriate level of oversight and transparency in what is now a multi-billion dollar privatised defence sec oh. defence security super department. What does that look like in policy form and can it be effectively monitored without compromising Australia's security issues? Well, of course we can do effective monitoring of defence without, you know, and drawing a proper boundary between what should be in the public domain, what politicians and, you know, oversight committees can get access to and, and, you know, and what's kept secret. Obviously, you don't, you know, publish Australia's war plans. You don't publish the details of, um, you know, all of the individual um, attributes of different weapons. You, 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 there are things you obviously have to keep secret, you know, uh, perhaps, you know, programs that we have to how we would coordinate with allies in the case of a major conflict. Some of those elements, those, those obviously national security elements would remain um, uh, you know, you would not discuss in public and nor should you. But for example, the idea that we can't disclose weapons, what weapons Australia exports. I mean, what, and apparently that's because of national security interests. What possible national security interest is there in Australia disclosing to the world what weapons it gives to Saudi Arabia? 
I can't work out what, what national security interest is impacted by that or what weapons we give to Israel. That's not, that's not our fight. What, how could that possibly be a national security risk? Um, and, and equally, far closer scrutiny of what weapons we acquire and, and the nature and the cost of them. I, I normally find out the, the actual cost of the, to the Australian taxpayer of weapons that we buy not from what Minister Miles says or from what the Defence Department says or what I read in Australian budget papers. The way I find out details about Australia's weapons procurements is I go to congressional um, publications in the US. The US has a far higher degree of transparency over Australia's weapon platforms than we do. So um, if I wanted to find out what the latest $1.6 billion spent on high Mars rocket fuel, rocket fired artillery um, expenditure was, Defence hasn't told us. They give us some, you know, repackaged media release with no details. You actually go to the congressional um, release, um, which details the weapons, the cost in US dollars, who the end user is, and that's how you find out. And then you reverse engineer from US dollars to Australian dollars. So, um, and the idea that we couldn't, for example, have far closer oversight when things like potential war crimes happen um, and have proper Senate inquiries into aspects of that. Obviously, you, you want to draw a boundary about whether or not that might prejudice a, a criminal investigation, but, you know, parliamentary privilege is a very powerful tool in these circumstances, which would allow us to get far greater insight. Um, and of course, you know, a far, far closer public scrutiny of the incredible delay and waste and over expenditure on a whole series of weapons procurement projects would be of vital interest to the Australian public. In the US, the, the the Defense Department has to repeatedly go to Congress and explain why projects are over budget, why they're over time, why they're requiring more money, and make some kind of credible public explanation for what's gone wrong. In Australia, they just give given the money by a bunch of toadies in Labor and the Coalition, who whenever they see someone turn up with a little bit of gold braid on their shoulders, just go to water and say, how much money can we give you and please don't ask please we won't ask you any questions and and that is i think it's bad for defense because we've seen how you know appallingly negligent they are with public money when no one's watching them um it's bad for taxpayers because huge amount of public money is squandered um and 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 i think our national interests would be served by far closer scrutiny on what happens in defense just before we move on to McBride and your federal marijuana bill. I'd like to get your very brief view, if I can, on where you think it's all going to go now in Gaza. Where do you see, because Israel only see one solution, that is winner takes all and they're being the winner. There doesn't appear to be room for compromise. There doesn't appear to be room for any other two-state solution other than what they want. And I'm just struggling to understand from here where it's going to go from here except for more bloodshed and misery for yet another generation of war refugees i don't know how israel can win in inverted commas a war against a people i mean that, that's uh, unless you're willing to literally engage in sort of you know mass killings of a people and um you know some kind of second nakba and force them across the border you that, that's I can't conceive of what is the Israeli Defence Force and the Israeli government conceive of as a win in this space. If, do you think that's an unlikely scenario, what you just outlined? Do you think, do you think there's any chance Israel is looking at that as a solution? Well, I, I think Israel would have very much liked to have seen the border with, his, with Egypt opened up and a, and a second Nakba to happen and mass movement of people out of, Giz, mm -hmm. out of Gaza, a second sort of Nakba of Palestinians. I, uh, I, you know, and for, for, for Egypt to keep the border shut in the face of such terrible humanitarian catastrophe across the other side, but also knowing, you know, not wanting to permit a second Nakba. I mean, it's a, these, are, these are appalling decisions that people are going to have to make in, in, in this conflict, those who, who want to see the Palestinian people not suffer in the, in, to the scale that they have. Um, I, I just... You know, they, they, there have been open statements made by senior Israeli government ministers that they want to um, acquire yet more land, take more of Gaza, 
incorporated into Israel. If that's their plan, that would be a, a, another gross breach of international law and, a, and an obviously ongoing human catastrophe for the people of Gaza, you know, an attempt to have ongoing direct Israeli um, rule in Gaza seems to be a recipe for absolute disaster going forward. And then to see the ridiculous proposal from the United States that somehow the, um, the regime in Ramallah, which has almost no political legitimacy in the West Bank, to suggest that that might take on uh, the um, administration of, of Gaza is, you know, has anybody followed the last 20 years of history to know that that is utterly unachievable? I think at this point, we have more questions than we have answers about what the outcome in the medium, short to medium term will be. But I, I know what I would like to see, a very short term, an urgent ceasefire, a withdrawal of Israeli occupation of Gaza, a, a, a rapid engagement by the international community, um, a provision of rebuilding and aid and support and demands from the international community for a final just peace. Um, for an end of the occupation. Um, maybe this is the one moment finally that we can say that, well, it was from this point on that the international community realised that they had an obligation here. You couldn't leave it to a battle between the state of Israel and the occupied people of Palestine. And, you know, if, you, if I have a small glimmer of hope coming out of this, that maybe it's the moment the international community realised that's just a recipe for ongoing generational disaster for the people of Palestine. Speaking of war crimes, I'd like to ask you now about the matter of David McBride. Now, as you'd be aware, he was forced to plead guilty last week to charges of illegally sharing military information. He did that, as I understand it, because there was a pre-sentencing judgment that a lot of the evidence he was relying on in his defence was inadmissible. I um, wanted to ask you, the Labor, during the election campaign, there was a feeling that the new Attorney General would at least consider um, dropping the case not only against Julian Assange but against David McBride as well. Neither of those cases were dropped. In the case of McBride, why do you think that is? Why didn't Mark Dreyfus pick up the phone and simply pull the plug before the thing went ahead? Why do you think that is? Well, I mean, there are there are really four prominent whistleblowers that are probably in the public discussion at the moment. Richard Boyle from the tax office, who blew the whistle on appallingly unethical practices in the tax office, backed in by an internal investigation in the ATO, found his concerns were credible and real, backed in by a Senate inquiry, currently facing criminal prosecutions for breaching tax secrecy provisions, no intervention from the Attorney General. David McBride, of course, who blew the whistle on war crimes in Afghanistan, being prosecuted. Julian Assange, no softening of the position really from, 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 from the Australian government. You know, a slight change in tone from the previous government. I'll give them that credit. There is a slight change in tone and this rather a, ambiguous statement that, you know, this has gone on too long, but no clear call to drop the prosecutions either of Julian Assange. And the one occasion where we saw a whistleblower have the charges dropped was Bernard Caleri, who was being prosecuted for his legal assistance to the people of Timor when Australia was um, engaged in a series of unethical treaty negotiations with uh, Timor Lest including bugging the lawyers, you know, illegal eavesdropping on the, the Timor Leste team, like the, the worst, most unethical and illegal practices by the Australian government, which led to, you know, deeply unequal treaties with Timor Leste over, over particularly offshore um, gas resources. Um, they then have the temerity, it's hard to believe, the Australian government then seeks to prosecute Bernard Kaliri. Um, um, and and the only reason he's not being prosecuted was it, it wasn't a sudden movement of concern from Mark Dreyfus about the human rights and the, the right for a lawyer to, you know, aggressively pursue the case. None of that. The reason Bernard Kaliri, the prosecution against Bernard Kaliri was dropped was because the East Timorese government made it very clear to the Australian government if they continued to, to prosecute their friend Bernard Kaliri, that the Timor Leste, the government of Timor Leste, would see Australia as a pretty hostile neighbour and look more closely to other friends, such as potentially um, the um, the Chinese government for ongoing, um, you know, diplomatic support, which focused the minds in Canberra, and eventually led to the prosecution being dropped against Bernard Kaliri. So I think when you realise that's the background, it makes you realise just. 
um, how little issues like freedom of speech, protecting whistleblowers, an ethical bureaucratic decision-making process, they don't even seem to be in the mix when it comes to whether or not these whistleblowers should be prosecuted. If, if there's a credible case that they breach some sort of state Commonwealth Secrecy Act, then the Commonwealth, whether it's under the coalition or Labor, seems perfectly happy to just keep prosecuting that, keep the secrets secret, shut the whistleblowers down, send this cold chill across the federal bureaucracy um, and seem quite comfortable with that. And, and, you know, if you saw what happened in the McBride trial last week, we saw an attempt at character assassination from the Commonwealth in their opening um, uh, address. They basically said, oh, David McBride had all of these secret hidden agendas and he wasn't being genuine. And, you know, it was a real attempt at character assassination of David McBride. And so if you ask me what's driving it, pretty much the same as drove the coalition. They want to keep their secrets secret. And, you know, even at the same time as they, they, they released literally last week, the irony of it is, the tragedy of it is they released a discussion paper that said, oh, the Australian whistleblowing laws are broken. They don't properly protect whistleblowers. And, oh, and by the way, we want to put David McBride in jail. So we've got a whistleblower only being protected by a foreign government who had a vested interest. And the only way we're finding out the true cost of our defence programs is through US Congress. So what does all of that say about Labor's alleged mandate for greater accountability in government that everyone was hoping after the last election? Well, you know, I'm a Green Senator, right? Um, I have seen Labor in opposition and then Labor in government on multiple occasions. And what we're seeing is Labor in government. You know, it, it turns out what Labor in government is is a totally different animal to what they promised in opposition. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm a particularly offended by their behaviour in the last week, you know, the ongoing prosecution of David McBride, you know, that pretty awful behaviour. Um, we've seen the um, the refusal to call for a ceasefire in Palestine, just can't conceive of how that could meet any ethical standard. Uh, and then we also saw in the last week, Labor working with the coalition and Peter Dutton to rush through laws um, in relation to a High Court decision that finally released some refugees from indefinite lifelong detention. And they rushed through those laws and they voted up, Labor voted up, Peter Dutton drafted amendments for mandatory sentencing of refugees if they're found to be in breach of certain visa conditions, they, 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 they will go to jail for a minimum one year, regardless of the excuse, regardless of the the, you know, the severity of it, regardless of anything, guaranteed jail for one year if they breach the visa conditions, mandatory minimum sentences, in circumstances where both Labor's 2021 and 2023 national platforms say that, you know, notionally adopted by their members, say that they, they oppose absolutely mandatory minimum sentencing because it attacks judicial independence, it produces unjust outcomes. That's what they say publicly before they get elected. They get on the government benches and literally last week they voted through some of the most offensive anti-refugee provisions in breach of their national platform just for the Peter Dutton because Peter Dutton was on his dog whistle and got them to line up and vote for it. It was it was actually pretty obscene. Um, Suzanne. So yeah, Labor in opposition and Labor in government. Speaking of the jurist, judiciary and jail sentences, I understand David McBride's some sense early next year. Is there any scope whatsoever that he might get some sort of a non-custodial sentence? And if not, what's the poor guy looking at? Well, I mean, I mean, the hope is that he gets a non-custodial sentence. The judge thankfully asked for a um, an assessment for what's called an intensive correctional order, which is a whether or not he would be suitable for a non-custodial sentence. So is that like cold as they use for a terrorist suspect? Yeah, basically, you know, um, reporting requirements, it could be home detention, it could be community service, it could be curfews, it could be all sorts of things. Could be, you know, not meeting with ratbag journalists in the Green Left Weekly or, or Green Senators, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that the judge suggests, you know, actively referred him off for an assessment for that. Okay. Um, but, you know, I don't think, I think we should have open eyes on this. Um, I think the, 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 the Commonwealth Attorney General's Department, they, they, they want to see McBride punished. I mean, how else do you explain what they've done? And 
as I said, they, their opening statement in the court was an attempted character assassination of him. I think people have been revolted by the prosecution of David McBride. It seems so utterly wrong. But the fact they've been willing to do it and press it through to a conviction after having knocked out his evidence and knocked out his legal defence, like they left him with nothing, he then yeah. pleads guilty. I wouldn't put it past them to try and put him in jail either. Well, best wishes to him and his family. We can only hope that the judge gets a report back that's favourable to some sort of non-custodial detention. It's just thanks to high heaven from start to finish that entire case. Now, I'd like to ask you now about your bill to legalise cannabis federally. Now, as we all know, all that most people in Parliament care about is the tax revenue. Now, as you've outlined in your submissions, it not only allows for medicinal um, taxed and regulated medical cannabis, but also for people to grow and use adults, adults to grow and use in their own home. Given the tens of billions of tax revenue and other income options to the government you've outlined in the submission, do you feel that's helped to support? What level of support are you hearing for this bill now? And what's the timeline when we might see a result? How's that all going? Yeah, well, I mean, incredibly strong support in the community for what we've done. Um, first time ever there's been an effort to legalise cannabis federally using the federal um, parliament, um, and that's required some legal creativity to, you know, ensure we have proper constitutional underpinning for that, and we've been greatly assisted by one of Australia's best constitutional legal minds, Patrick Professor Patrick Kaiser, who identified that pathway for us. Um, and, um, you know, there's not a small amount of money in this. Uh, the, the figures we've got from the Parliamentary Budget Office, um, which is an independent office that assesses political pr proposals from political parties, they say that there's about 28 or $29 billion of public revenue in just the first nine years of legalising cannabis. And that seems a lot of good reasons to legalise cannabis. Um, we won't interfere with the existing medicinal market. We leave that alone and leave that to be regulated as a medicine by the Therapeutical Goods um, Authority. Um, but what we create is a, is a we have, we think, quite a balanced uh, recreational market for cannabis um, where we try and democratise the market a bit, limit the extent to which for-profit corporations can be involved in it so we have more sm small tr sole trader, cooperative kind of models, particularly for the growing of cannabis. And we think that's the, if we legalise cannabis, it, it's, a, it's a very strong driver of growth and secure jobs, particularly in regional parts of the country. Um, I'm told cannabis grows like a weed, actually, and, it's, <laughs> and it would be very useful. There are big parts of particularly, you know, the north of my home state of, of, of New South Wales where um, a, a legal, legitimate cannabis market could literally drive lots of secure well-paid, sustainable jobs in, in regional Australia. Um, we prohibit um, big pharma, big alcohol and big tobacco from having any role in it. Um, we prohibit imports, so we create a, um, a clear domestic market um, and which doesn't get overwhelmed by Canadian inputs. We put labelling, quality controls, strength controls, um, um, uh, we, we actually make it a properly regulated market and we create a new national authority to, to regulate that. So first of all, you have labelling. So, you know, if it's organic, you ensure that there are no pesticides in it, no contaminants in it, you know, the strength of it. Um, that'll be tested as well and validated. We have a national regulator that will do all of that. Um, so we see this as a kind of win, 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 win. What about the first this side of your proposal, what, what, does it, what does it do in terms of allowing people to grow and use in your own home? Mm. So um, our proposal would allow people to grow up to six plants at home without needing a licence, without being taxed, up to six plants at home. And then indoor or outdoor, the only restriction is they can't be in a place where they're accessible to the public which seems to me like a pretty sensible way of growing your cannabis anyhow. <laughs> but, uh, but you can't have them, you know, available so kids can pick it on the way home, for example. It's got to be secure um, and not accessible to the public. Although we don't mind them being exposed to gambling, um, alcohol and cigarette advertising. Yeah. Yeah. And it... but, but also we do put significant restrictions on advertising. The, almost no online advertising, only a, a sort of um, a re very restricted form of online advertising from cannabis cafes and dispensaries that will 
be limited to delivering to a, a targeted local um, um, community. So we, again, we don't just have two big cannabis distribution outlets, one in Sydney and one in Melbourne. We literally democratise the market and, mm -hmm. and we don't see huge amounts of corporate advertising. You won't open up your phone and be overwhelmed by cannabis advertising because it'll be illegal, illegal in our model. And so you do all of that. You improve the health, you provide clear labelling, people know what they're buying, we regulate the industry, we make it safer, we provide sustainable jobs, tens of billions of dollars of public revenue, um, um, and we also grossly disempower organised crime. We take billions and billions of dollars out of organised crime and put it into regular businesses, and we keep about 60,000 people a year out of the criminal justice system who are currently being whacked for the crime of cannabis possession. Like, you know, politicians who push against this um, are pushing against it just simply because they, they their head is in the 1950s and all they can say is drugs are bad. Now, a lot of people have expressed concern to me that all of this regulation and testing and X amount of plants you can have, is going to be used against people that simply want to grow a couple of plants in peace in their own backyard. What level of regulation or harassment are they likely to face as a result? Well, if you're growing up to six at home in your backyard, none. You can't be prosecuted. You don't need a licence. Um, um, you can, if you want, then make some brownies or, um, you know, your cannabis matcha latte in the afternoon out of it. If that's what you want to do, you can dry it, store it. If you've got up to six plants at home by yourself, you will be perfectly legal and the police won't be able to monster you. It, it actually sounds like a good outcome, says that to me. What if there's children in the house? Because a lot of people seem to have a significant concerns about whether or not children are able to access it when it's been grown by adults in their own home. Well, just, uh, just as just as children can access alcohol in the home um, or cigarettes in the home, we would expect people to be responsible parents and ensure we're not here to be their nanny. Um, but just as with alcohol or tobacco, you know, it, 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 it will be a crime to provide cannabis to children, to intentionally provide cannabis to children, um, and I think for very good reasons. But, you know, we're not here to... To jump in and tell people, you know, how they keep kids safe from alcohol or how they keep keep keeps mm -hmm. keep keep kids safe from tobacco, but we would expect responsible parenting as well when it comes to cannabis. Or to lose at a pharmaceutical lobby, once it's legalised for personal use, then yeah. it's going to cost them a lot. So no doubt about that, because there's so many conditions that it does help, and without side effects. Although some people might disagree with yeah. that, I'm not a clinician. So how hard are they pushing against this, the pharmaceutical lobby? Yeah, well, I, we'll have to finish here, Suzanne. But yes, the um, two things I'd say about that is there is some there is some resistance from within the medicinal cannabis industry right now, because the medicinal cannabis industry has been rapidly expanding in Australia, and uh, pretty much any fair-minded observer would say a big chunk of their expansion has been into the recreational market, and they they're worried that they will lose that. It's very expensive. It's highly regulated. They worry that they'll lose some of that market that they have notionally as medicinal cannabis which will go into a recreational market and i think they're right that's probably the case um but that's because i think a chunk of what's medicinal cannabis now is actually being effectively sold as recreational cannabis um, there is also you know the pharmaceutical industry is not super chuffed by our proposal that they be excluded from this and same with the alcohol industry and same with tobacco you know we yeah. see big tobacco globally wanting to get into the cannabis industry because they think of it as a growth pro project Personally, I think they're a global blood sucking industry and I want them as far away from any new market as we can possibly create. So we propose they not have a part in this and I, they're not happy. But, you yeah, know, we're, we're, we've created a bill which we think is in the public interest, not in the interest of big alcohol, big tobacco or big pharma. And on that note, we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much for your time today, Senator Shubridge. It's very much appreciated. Oh, I, I appreciate it too. And thanks for all your work throughout the year. Thank you, David. Always lovely to catch up. This is Suzanne James for Green Left, talking to Suze Green's New South Wales Senator David Shoebridge. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.